The opening sequence of episode 32 is a tad different to what we've seen recently, as it's neither Armin's narration or explicit recap. Rather, it is a cold open of that talk we saw between Air and Reiner, Bertolt and Armin way, way back in season 1. Considering the events of the previous episode, them sharing this moment in their dreams, all the while this somber piano plays in the background, just sets a somewhat bleak tone that would resonate throughout the episode. In hindsight, however, while this is a reminder from Aaron's perspective about his strong admiration of Reiner, I think it also hits just as hard when viewed from Reiner's and Bertolt's perspectives. Much like we talked about way, way back in episode 3, as much as they are both still undercover, every word that comes out of their mouths here is 100% genuine. When Reiner talks about wanting to return to his hometown, Aaron clearly interprets it as the village Reiner mentioned during their training, while in reality, he's referring to Marley, their true hometown. And so much like the scenes we get of them atop the wall, Reiner telling Aaron that he's certain he would make a good soldier, accompanied by that somber and almost haunting piano melody, clearly paint everything here in a far more regretful light. I know you've got what it takes. Though what I think is easily the best part here is the transition from that cold open to the present day, with the entire scene suddenly appearing to liquefy, symbolizing how Aaron's tears now obscure those memories. And as the music cuts out, we return right back to Aaron's transformation. His eyes are still teary, but in complete silence, we see that sorrowful rage now boiling inside of him. Damn you! You traitor! And what I think is super important here, even aside from the themes the opening presents, are the expectations set by this first clash between Aaron and Reiner. Aaron's punch here is absolutely brutal, with him pummeling Reiner square in the face and then sending him sliding against the wall. Considering what we saw with his fight against Annie and him literally sending her flying, this sort of plants the seed in your mind that, armor or no armor, Aaron's attacks still pack a punch. That is, of course, until he punches back. I mean, yeah, this is Attack on Titan. I do think that this scene here is deliberately placed there to challenge that exact belief. To make us think that Aaron does have a solid chance, even in a full-on fistfight, only to entirely subvert that moments later. As for the title of the episode, Close Combat, I think this one has a couple of very straightforward interpretations. First off, as the name very much suggests, all the fighting we see in this one is entirely hand-to-hand -hand based. So fighting closely is sort of a given. Everything from Annie's techniques to the full-on brawl between Aaron and Reiner, all of it is literally very close. Though secondly, I also think there's the emotional closeness angle, with Aaron's rage largely not even coming from Reiner's inherent actions, but rather the fact that he betrayed their trust after literal years of acting as their friends. And for Aaron, that just hits particularly hard because of his profound admiration of Reiner. More on this in a bit. Moving into the episode itself, we open with Mikasa hooked onto the wall, clearly still in shock about everything that just went down, but then trying to mull over why she missed her opportunity, saying that she should have been able to slice their heads clean off, but why didn't she? Much like we've discussed before, and like also depicted in the opening where we see the hearts beating inside all of them, I think Mika's struggle here is simply a reflection of her humanity. Even in the face of the cold reality that is blatant betrayal, she couldn't bring herself to truly strike at them, with us even getting glimpses of the terrified expressions of Reiner and Bertolt. Throughout this episode, I think Mikasa is often likened to Annie, and just like Annie back in Stoess, with her too denying the truth even when she was being led directly into a trap, Mikasa just can't yet bring herself to strike at someone who she for years thought to be her ally. I think it's just a really nice bit of realism to show us that this isn't some typical oh I was the bad guy all along, and the script is just entirely flipped in an instant as if we were robots. No, it is hard to come to terms that what you believed is wrong. I mean, there's a reason why so, so many people get almost offended when you try to correct them, and others simply try to hide the fact that they've been a victim of some trickery. All of it comes down to our own humanity, and I think that is even further strengthened by, again, the absolutely horrified faces of Reiner and Bertolt. I think just those few frames completely dispel the notion that they are some unshakable, heartless beings who destroyed the wall and just aimed to kill everyone. While we clearly don't yet understand their goals, their humanity is evidence. And judging by Reiner's meltdown in the previous episode, clearly there's just a whole lot more to it. Though yes, as we hear that somber piano in the background, we see Bertolt, Yuen Kamir, and importantly, at least one other soldier. Don't forget that for the past few days, they have been isolated from everyone and their gear was taken away due to Erwin's suspicions over more traitors. 
So the other soldier here isn't some super crucial story beat or anything like that, but rather just a practicality that Berthold must take care of. So yes, drop your Fs in the chat for whoever that was because Berthold just needed some ODM gear. It is what it is. Though just as we sink into those depths of despair, Hanji calls out to them, with the music suddenly taking a sharp turn from that slow piano to these plucking strings that quickly turn into a full-on battle theme. So and the animation we see here is nothing short of excellence. I know I've said this many, many times already, but I am a continuous shot enjoyer. I do not want 60 million cutaways for a 7 second scene. So seeing them all fly all the way up the wall, which again gives us an immediate sense of scale as to just how big the Colossal is, and we then see them briefly hover in front of its lumbering body, almost as small as flies, the steam from it alone taking up the entire scene. And oh boy, the way CG is leveraged here is the absolute perfect example of why I can't stand the usual wah CG bad stuff you often hear with anime discourse. Don't get me wrong, bad CG is bad CG and there's not much else to say there. Yes, bad things are bad. Yes, grass is green. But not for a second would I say that this is that. First off, I think even in a purely visual sense, while some jump to saying, oh it stands out from everything else, in scenes like this, I would actually say that that's a very good thing, because to me, it is meant to stand out. Just like I said with the Reiner reveal happening in the background of the episode, leverages the very medium itself to place us as the viewers in the same disbelief as the characters in-universe, the Colossal here seeming so much more vibrant than everything else around him and its movements being these slow and lumbering gestures, just really work to convey the sheer unprecedented power that the scouts are going up against. Admittedly, I do seem to recall that some of these scenes did seem a little bit jankier when they were first airing, but in the Blu-ray releases at least, the composition of the scenes makes each and every shot absolutely beautiful, even if it is full-blown CG. Like take the shot of Burrito throwing the punch for example. We focus on him pulling his shoulder back and then thrusting the fist forward, not for a second cutting away. We see the entire weight of that punch, with it even momentarily going slow motion to show us just how much power behind it there is. But secondly, and far far more importantly for me, because again, I am a fluid movement enjoyer, the shots we get here of the scouts, who are all 2D by the way, zipping all around the Colossal's arm would simply be impossible to do on a seasonal anime budget. Especially for what is, like what, a 5 second scene? But to me, that 5 second scene is absolutely vital in conveying the sheer size of the Colossal. Which, also side note, Note how perspective is used here, with the arm seeming almost impossibly long. We'll be talking about this later in Season 3 as well, but again, it just all comes down to conveying its size. Something that can be done far far more efficiently when you mix in CG environments for easier and cheaper backgrounds, while still using 2D characters in the forefront. Exactly like Aaron's transformation in Trost, and exactly like these fly around scenes of the Colossal. But anyway, all the ODM gear excellence aside, Burrito pulls the ultimate reverse Uno and blasts them with an all-out steam attack, immediately forcing all of them to detach and retreat before they all get burned. And another side note, the volumetric cloud-like smoke here looks really really cool. Though as the scouts all gather up, we get to see some more interesting information of symmetry. Hanji immediately says that he's disappearing again, only for Armin to correct them stating that, no, this time it seems different. In Trost, he just vanished immediately, but this time he is emitting heat yet still keeping his form. If you recall all the, is it a plot hole that he can just vanish without a trace, why is Aaron not burned if he did vanish so so quickly, and everything else like that that we talked about in Trost, naturally the same conversation has popped up here. Though unlike him attempting to tank Armin later in Season 3, I think him not disappearing here actually has a very straightforward explanation, and him retaining his form, to me at least, makes much more strategic sense than him simply poofing. For simplicity's sake, we will leave the Season 3 incident for when we get there. But in this case, I think it's as simple as him keeping his form to 1. buy as much time as he can for Reiner who is still clashing with Eren, and 2. he still has Amir chilling in his mouth. Huh? That sounded really really weird, but I guess that's just Attack on Titan. So even if the vanishing ability is not a plot hole and a power he actually does possess, then poofing here would I think just cause too much headache as trying to maneuver through the absolute swarm of scouts with a still unconscious Amir likely would not end well. We'll get to this a tad later as well, but the paradoxical thing about this entire fight is that the scouts can't really get involved in the fight against Reiner without getting in Eren's way and potentially getting crushed themselves. 
And so, the Colossal here is largely a perfect decoy to keep their attention at all times. In fact, I think if this battle were to happen at one of the districts and not just some random point atop wall rows, Bertolt might even opt to destroy the gates to give them yet another thing to worry about and just take the heat off of themselves. Get it? Heat? Because Bertolt emanates a ton of heat? Though yes, as of right now, I think Burrito just takes it slow because he already got a mirror and he already got the ODM gear they need to escape. So right now, all that is left is for Reiner to defeat Eren. Though returning to Hanji and Armin, both try to figure out what their next course of action is. With Armin quickly piecing together that, yes, this is indeed some sort of protection mechanism. While Hanji says that, they should just wait him out. And this shot we get of them standing against the Colossal, its looming figure, the steam and the embers enveloping the entire sky, almost giving off the sense that we stand at the gates of hell is just so, so cool. I'll bring up Lord of the Rings because of course I will, but it very much gives off the vibes of Gandalf standing against Balrog for me. But anyway, fantasy nerd Kuroto aside, we then see another turn in the music. With it turning from that battle music we heard a moment ago to a far more eerie and uneasy tune. <laughs> Even now, we don't yet understand what their goals are or even what they're capable of to the point that we can't even fight them properly. And so Hanji gives the command. Give up any hope of capturing them. If you have the chance, you strike to kill. And to immediately remind us of who it is we are going up against and who Hanji just said to kill, we jump back to Historia and Kani who are trying to get the injured scouts out with Astoria immediately begging them to just save Amir, while Connie just screams that they need to save Reiner and Bertolt, saying that they don't have their ODM gear. And yeah, this is very much a perfect place for that he doesn't know image. Because oh, our poor boy, he was so far back in the crowd that he didn't even notice who it was that transformed. So in his mind, his good friends Reiner and Bertolt, both of whom offer to go with him to his hometown, are now in desperate need of his help. While in reality, that demon in front of him is Bertolt. And as much as it is just a bit of a yikes situation, I think it is just another reminder of just how far reaching the consequences of this betrayal are, and how it's not as simple as everyone suddenly picking up arms and going against Reiner and Bertolt. It's not just emotional and interpersonal bridges that have now been burnt. It is also a matter of how information even travels, with Connie literally just not even knowing who it was that just transformed. And you know, this is Attack on Titan, so perhaps worst yet, don't forget that he also does not know that Annie too has already betrayed them. So yeah, at this point, he is in for a very, very rude awakening. But at the same time, I think there's also a case to be made that this might just be some incredibly strong denial, as in, he saw the Titans appeared exactly where Reiner and Bertolt stood, but just like Eren, he simply refuses to believe his own eyes. If you wish to play up the whole Connie is often quite silly angle, it could literally be him seeing them transform, but just not putting two and two together to realize that it was actually them that transformed. Though it's exactly with this that Attack on Titan once again completely subverts the usual anime tropes. Because just as Connie begs for them to help Reiner and Bertolt, we hop back to Eren, who is literally sent flying by Reiner's punch. First off, again, the emotional weight of that betrayal being on full display with us cutting from the naive Connie begging them to save Reiner, to seeing Eren absolutely destroyed by said Reiner, I don't think I need to say much more. Though secondly, remember what I said about how this fight began. In usual anime fashion, we open the fight with Eren's transformation and him immediately pummeling Reiner square in the face, clearly conveying the sheer strength behind Eren's punches even against the armored, especially because, don't forget, we have never seen the armored fights. Though we now cut to Eren, who is missing his right arm, his left hand is absolutely destroyed and he is now literally sent flying and tumbling through dozens of trees with the most basic of jabs from Reiner. By skipping over the entire start of the fight and simply showing us Eren flying through the air and lying half dead on the floor, it immediately tells us that, oh boy no, he is so far and beyond outmatched that it's almost laughable with Eren himself then mumbling to himself about how Reiner was probably holding back this entire time. And this is something that I've always loved about Attack on Titan. None of the fights we ever really see are in any way fair or evenly matched. I don't like power scaling, but let's be honest, in a straightforward one-on-one -on -one fight, Reiner would absolutely decimate Eren, as he should considering his far greater experience and far greater mass due to his armor. But that's the thing, the fights are not fair by design. 
Eren lost against Dany even while she was weakened. And the only reason he later won in Stoess was because she was always on the back foot and trying to escape what is literally hundreds of scouts going after her. Ditto for this fight. With or without Eren using Annie's technique, I think if Reiner didn't have to worry about the dozen or so scouts and more importantly Mikasa buzzing around, he would have crushed Eren without too much effort. And for me, that is exactly what makes all of these fights so so interesting. It isn't some arbitrary measure of strength, rather it is a constant game of trying to see who can gain a tactical and often completely unfair advantage. More on this in a second. Though as we jump back to Eren, we see him quickly realize just how far outmatched he is. With him also briefly reminiscing about how he used to look up to Reiner and saying that he wanted to be as strong as he was. So again, that emotional bond that still keeps them tethered. Much like we saw Armin start to address the female titan as Annie, here, Eren is purely talking to Reiner. The titan itself largely does not matter. And another side note, the dub here actually changes a few lines ever so slightly that, for me at least, make them hit a lot harder. And here I took you to be a real stand-up guy. I'd have given anything in the world to be half as strong as you. You are my hero. I'm not a huge fan of the dub's audio mastering when it comes to speech inside of the Titans, and while both versions obviously talk about how Reiner was not just a friend but a role model to Eren, but for some reason the inclusion of the word hero just pulls on some heartstrings a wee bit more for me. Though we then see Mikasa swoop in, her blades snapping against Reiner's back almost like twigs, with Reiner not even noticing her presence. I think from her perspective, she is currently almost trying to repent for her failure atop the wall. She blames herself for not being able to cut them down while they were still human. And so here, she is just helplessly prodding away at Reiner's shoulder, with the attacks clearly being next to useless. And because this is Mikasa, I think that just hits exponentially harder. I mean, if she can't do anything against the armor, then who can? And also, also, the shot we get from her perspective as we sort of rewind in time to see Eren's punches barely even making Reiner flinch was a really really cool touch. Though of course, because this is Mikasa, all of her attacks are purely to make sure that Reiner never reaches Eren, who again is lying in a state of, let's say, half-consciousness. But it's as she calls out to him that his mind suddenly focuses, the music now accentuating that turn. And here, there are a bunch of things I want to note. First off, Eren continues his inner monologue, saying that he can't see Reiner's face to tell how he truly feels about this, but effectively saying that, irregardless, they are disgusting and that they are the worst kind of human trash. Glimpses of Shigan Shinup flooding back into his mind. It's this bizarre mix of confusion, with him straight up asking, what were you thinking? But also, this seething rage, as he says he has never been so disgusted in his life and that they need to be exterminated. But most importantly, we never actually see Reiner's side of the story. Neither Reiner nor Bertolt ever say a single word in this entire wall sequence. The show chooses to give us the tiniest glimpse into the fractured mind of Reiner as he transforms, but then firmly plants us right back into the shoes of Eren with one simple goal. I think it wants to show us that boiling hatred within Eren stemming from that betrayal, only to subvert it moments after. In classic Attack on Titan fashion, we get that triumphant building music. Eren rises up, screaming at the top of his lungs, and then throws a punch at Reiner. But just like that, he is sent flying to the point that our guy breaks the sound barrier. Number one, I think it just subverts your typical anime scream louder power up. But number two, implicitly it makes you wonder, what is it that Reiner is fighting for? If his strength is so far beyond Eren's, who is literally fighting for all of humanity right now, then what could be behind the mask? In this case, a very literal titan mask of Reiner. If this is the kind of power he truly wields, just what kind of trauma had he gone through to have that complete meltdown atop the wall? But again, for the time being, we are never let in on it. He never speaks a word, and the emotional distance and sorrow of Reiner is portrayed purely through his absolute unwavering strength. With no emotion, no difficulty, no real thought behind it, he throws a single punch sending Eren soaring through the sky. That is the type of power he wields, and that is the type of dedication he has. 
Though before we move on, I did say no more fantasy nerd Kuroto, but I did not say anything about Norse mythology. And yes, I do know this is very much me overanalyzing. One thing that I absolutely adored in the earlier seasons of Attack on Titan is how Wit portrayed Titan regeneration. I briefly mentioned this back in Trust as well, but those colorful threads slowly rebuilding his body is just awesome from a visual sense. But I also think it could be AOT's way of depicting Bivrost, the rainbow road that connects Midgard, the world of humans, and Asgard, the realm of gods. Or, in Attack on Titan's case, the paths that caused the regeneration to happen in the first place. And Emir, he's obviously a god. And okay, if I were to go very, very deep tinfoil, the Rainbow Road is also foretold to be destroyed during Ragnarok, or in Attack on Titan's case, the rumbling because Eren would sever the connection to the Titans and the Founder. And you know who would destroy it? Yes, the forces of Muselheim. Those being fire giants, or in Attack on Titan's case, very, very hot and steaming giants. But okay, I admit that is like mega overanalyzing. My wackiness aside though, we then jump on over to the mid cards talking about Titan martial arts, basically just saying that, yeah, it works just like normal martial arts. Strength is cool, but technique and experience reign supreme, just like we'd see with Eren's grappling. And speaking of Eren's grappling, Reiner apparently punched him so hard to send him back in time, with us seeing all of them, including Annie, who we of course now also know to be a shifter, training together. I think this is a bit of a wake-up moment for Eren that many who he held close are now betraying him one after another. Though with the experience he has now gained through the likes of Levi, he does not simply write them off. Rather, for better or worse, he learns from them and then repays in kind. With Annie's grappling, of course being a micro-scale example of that, and far later in the story, the attack on Liberio and the rumbling being the ultimate climax of all of that. Though in story, we of course see Annie teach him how to grapple, joking that it would also have the added benefit of teaching him how to talk to women. But they are then quickly interrupted by Reiner, who comes crashing down after being sent flying by Mikasa. Which number one, yes, I do think is just your usual funny goofy of Mikasa getting angry about Annie getting close to Eren. But two, as I mentioned earlier, brings up the interesting implication that behind Eren and Reiner stand Mikasa and Annie respectively. Both of whom are actually the far more capable fighters. Also, yes, for everyone who's been asking, at some unspecified time in the future, I will talk about the Lost Girls OVAs. The thing is, they are not written by Isayama, so they're not really canon, but there is still interesting stuff in them to talk about, so we will talk about them at some point. Soon TM. Though this whole little flashback we get, I think speaks to a lot of what we'd be seeing in the present day, and the roles Mikasa and Annie played, and would play. Both are clearly absolute monsters in combat, but their motivations differ substantially and would translate directly into the loss of the Marley squad and the victory of Eren. As much as Annie did carry out much of Reiner's dirty work, they all largely fought alone and Reiner never truly learned from her. Whereas with Mikasa and Eren, it is the complete opposite. Mikasa fights for Eren and Eren learns even from his enemies. Of course, because this is Attack on Titan, in this particular battle, even that parallel would be subverted because a Wild Sands appeared, but in the long run, we would of course see how the lack of Annie, the most experienced fighter among them, seriously hurt their plans. And speaking of Annie and Mikasa, it is also here where we get what is probably the biggest cliffhanger in the entire series. We see a fight start between them, but we never learn what the outcome was. I know power scalers have been going mad about this for literal years now, but I think the pretty clearly implied stalemate is exactly what happens. It's probably like Keith or something just walking in and telling them to knock it off or something like that. I think answering the question of who was truly stronger was never the point. But okay, if you like really, really want to know what I think, I think it would have been a case of Annie grappling Mikasa just because she has a lot more hand-to-hand -hand combat experience. But I also think Mikasa's raw strength and her general combat experience would still be able to overwhelm Annie and break out of that grapple. From which point, I think it's basically rinse and repeat until Annie runs out of stamina and Mikasa's Ackerman buff just gains the upper hands. And obviously we are talking about like no titans here, right? Because like if Annie transforms, Mikasa doesn't have her swords, well then, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, like I said, the story I think clearly implies a stalemate, so I just don't really think about it that much. Though as we return to the present, we see Eren grapple Reiner, which by the way, the animation in the sequence is just beautiful, but Eren quickly brings him to the ground. And also, the music and general composition of the scene is absolutely perfect. The almost biblical music constantly going on in the background as we see these two quite literally titanic creatures battle, almost like mythological gods, with Mikasa standing between them just like this small speck, perfection.
In terms of setting the overall tone, this is easily one of my favorite all-out battle sequences, that's for certain. It almost feels like a Dark Souls boss. Though when it comes to Eren's grappling, much like the midcards mentions, this is something I thought was really, really cool. In a different life, I myself did a whole bunch of martial arts, and even though I took Taekwondo for the longest time, which is more so fly around and kick the other dude in the face, and is less so any sort of ground fighting, even just a couple of weeks of KFM and MMA were enough to teach me just how dangerous a proper grapple can be. Obviously, with sufficient strength, you can still break through, but it definitely levels out any large differences in mass. So I think it's very much one of those times where the series continues to mess with the usual preconceived notions of what power truly is. We saw Eren go for the usual scream louder anime power buff, but that was quickly subverted by Reiner's absolutely devastating punch. But now that too is being entirely subverted by technique. So again, it just turns all of these battles into this constant back and forth that is, again, not entirely fair. Though with Aaron having him in a firm headlock and then later severing his arm, they seem to have the upper hand. That was not a pun. But Armin quickly lets him know that they need to play it safe, telling him to get closer to the wall and telling them that their goal is to capture him. And by the way, in case anyone's wondering how they suddenly pieced all this together, it's just all the context clues fitting together ever since the female titan mission. Reiner clearly gave intel to Annie to go after Aaron, so clearly Aaron is the target. And now they transform talking to Eren, so yes, they are trying to capture Eren and go off to who knows where. But again, much like Eren picking up Annie's technique, this time he isn't entirely overcome with rage and actually listens. And so, all of them quickly retreat back toward the wall, of course also knowing that Reiner won't just give up. And just as we see Hannes make it up the wall, we briefly catch a glimpse of the Colossal's face, which is now almost entirely steamed away, just leaving a open skull. A bit of a cheeky wink for the second time watchers that our big boy is about to run out of mass to steam away. Some might even say those ribs we saw clang onto the wall were almost like guns on walls, huh? And we all know what Chekhov says about guns on walls. But as we return to Aaron, we see Hanji land on his shoulder, telling him that they just need to outsmart Reiner, not beat him. And they then tell him that he should just go for his leg just to buy some time. And as Aaron gives them a quick nod, we get a scene that still gets me every single time. But again, this is Attack on Titan, so clearly the plan we just carefully laid out will be immediately subverted as Reiner begins to drop his plates and rush at Aaron at sonic speeds. And almost right away, we are right back to grappling. Again, the animation here is absolutely stunning, but almost right away we see Hanji come to the conclusion that he must be trading defense for speed likening him to medieval warriors who kept certain parts of the body uncovered for movements. Something that is of course just Hanji being big brain as usual, but also tells you that the history of Paradis is very much like her own. If you remember the whole, Titans appeared a hundred years ago, well it sort of makes you wonder where that split in history came from, right? It's obviously not on the level of revealing a whole different continent like Udgard did, but it's just another small clue toward the fact that the world of Attack on Titan is not actually that different from our own. Even with the usual fantasy shenanigans of ODM gear and whatnot, the history we share is almost alarmingly similar. Almost as if we were just on a small island and the world itself is basically the exact same. And again, the heroic version of Call Your Name fades into the background as we get this constant back and forth between Aaron literally trying to break Reiner in half, while Mikasa zips around in some absolutely gorgeous ODM gear scenes. Though an interesting thing to note here that I've also briefly touched on before, in fights like this, we have a somewhat paradoxical situation of we can't really outnumber the enemy because we have no safe means of fighting side by side. This will be an odd comparison, but bear with me here. In series like Sword Art Online, for example, there are also several instances of people having to stay back or try to switch in and out simply because fighting a single enemy at melee range with everyone's swords flying all over the place is just not safe. Which again, I think makes Mikasa's role here particularly interesting from the whole Annie Mikasa parallel perspective I mentioned earlier. Obviously, none of this will matter because Burrito decides to become Skeletor, but unlike Reiner, who is fighting solo and doesn't have the far more experienced fighter Annie watching his back, Eren does have Mikasa. And she actually delivers an absolutely crucial blow to Reiner's knee, effectively enabling Eren's victory. Though as Reiner lets out a scream, we return to atop the wall where that biblical singing suddenly turns to just this lone strum of a guitar, 
with us then getting this unnaturally long and lingering scene on Connie, Astoria, and Hannes as the slow realization sets in. And for one final time, the music takes a drastic shift as the ribs of the Colossal begin to crack and its lumbering torso comes crashing down directly on top of Aaron and Reiner. And yes, the series chooses violence because that is in fact where the episode ends. One of the most painful cliffhangers throughout the series, that's for certain. Honestly surprising even me since most of this was just fighting, this one turned out to be another solo episode video. So we'll have to see how the rest of the season pans out. Considering the amount of founding titan shenanigans and whatnot, I'm guessing we'll be back to having a few more solo episodes from here on out. But anyway, next time we'll be talking plenty about more colossal titan shenanigans and how his whole crashing down here changes things, and of course entering the chase mini arc where absolutely everything goes haywire. So, I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. From here on out, Season 2 gets only more wild, and because I have the Attack Titan, I can tell you that the next one is also a solo episode video. There's a ton of stuff to talk about. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Also, in case you're interested, I'm like 60 chapters deep into Berserk and all of my initial reactions are up for patrons and YouTube members. Spoilers, I am absolutely loving it and at some point soon TM, there is definitely something coming for the main channel as well. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye